We mentioned um, last week, we'll just return to this briefly, how St. John the Cross, he adds a lot of clarity uh, to this, to these visits of the Lord, what we mean by it, <clears throat> and it's needed clarity. So St. Bernard, you read him sometimes, and you know it can be like, well, the Lord's coming and going, but isn't he always present? And so we were able to think through that more with some things we learned in spiritual theology first semester, but also looking at John the Cross, uh, Spiritual Canto 11, where he speaks of three modes of God's presence. His natural presence, which is everywhere. Uh, number two, his um, presence in the soul in a state of grace. And then number three, this presence by um, affectivity, a- affective love, a movement of, of love in our hearts. From a mystical presence, we could say, this presence of infused contemplation, uh, this touch, this kiss of love. So that's the third mode of presence, and that's what Bernard means uh, by the comings and goings of the Lord. Um, So St. John of the Cross, he's very good at bringing clarity there, which is much needed. Um, Yeah, because you read Bernard, you're like, well, what is he talking about here? And then, um, so we can see why John the Cross added that clarity. Another way that he adds great clarity, John the Cross, is in Spiritual Canticle 1. I'll just open this up. I mean, you know I love this this chapter. <laughs> just open it up a little bit more, especially since you now have your own copies. <laughs> and you can mark up uh, your text there. And so, you know, we have this. I remember when I first started to read this to get into this. Where have you hidden, beloved, and left me moaning? You fled like the stag after wounded me. I went out calling you, but you were gone. When I first read that, you know, I have this sense of kind of, yeah, our experience in this life where sometimes you have a sense of God's presence, sometimes you don't. Um, And it it does kind of suggest that. Where have you hidden? Um, Beloved, and left me moaning, you fled like the stag. So it's like the bridegroom is present, and then he flees like the stag after wounding me. I went out calling you, but you were gone. So it seems like to map on that experience of, okay, we have this strong sense of God's presence, and then it departs from us sometimes. But then when you read John's commentary on it, where have you hidden? Then he starts talking about the beatific vision. Uh, we'll only see the Lord revealed in heaven in that face-to-face vision. That's what you know our hearts are crying out for. And so when I first read that, I was like, "Wait a second, no! It's like it seems like he's talking about something else." Um, so why does John start commenting there? And, and you'll notice that so John of the Cross deals with that stanza one on that level. It's the beatific vision that we're yearning for. He, um, he deals on that level the first five paragraphs of stanza one. Um, and by five paragraphs, I mean the numbering in, in your, your text. You know, sometimes one number in, involves a couple paragraphs. But um, Okay, so the first five paragraphs of stanza one, it's about where have you hidden? Well, he's hidden in the bosom of the Father. And we won't see him in this life. We keep yearning for him until we see him face to face in the next life. But then at number six onwards, there's a shift. And now he's beginning to talk about the comings and goings of the bridegroom and being present, a sense of his absence, in terms of that third mode of God's presence, mystical affection, uh, that infused contemplation, the level that St. Bernard is speaking about. And so what frustrated me at first in reading John, like it doesn't seem to fit with like, the inner spirit of this stanza. Why, why does he making this move? But now I appreciate it, mm-hmm. why he is. He's adding much needed clarity to like St. Bernard. You know, so John of the Cross, he wants to be very theologically precise. Like, what do we yearn for in the absence of, of the bridegroom? And ultimately, what we yearn for is the beatific vision. That's what this yearning is about, that this pining for the Lord to return to, to show himself. So that that's important. Um, to have that level. You know, so that's always behind our yearning and pining, uh, is for the Lord to, to come in that final revelation, that final manifestation, second coming, the beatific vision. 
And so John of the Cross is tidying up with what is like more ambiguous than St. Bernard. St. Bernard doesn't lay it out so, so clearly. I mean, you get bits and pieces of the same. But St. John of the Cross being much more systematic, um, he's kind of, yeah, being very precise in what this is about. And so that's why he starts with the beatific vision and talking about it on this level. Um, and so, it's, yeah, it's great. To, uh, I mean, that only occurred to me probably in the past year. Uh, looking at this, and so it's beautiful to like to begin to enter into uh, the inner thinking of John the Cross, mm-hmm. and to like get at okay, this is what he's up to. I see what he's up to here. Why he's doing this. Um, and then number six onwards, he begins speaking on that level that makes sense with the spirit of the stanza. Where have you hidden, beloved, and left me moaning? You fled like the stag after wounded me. I went out calling you, but you were gone. You know, you were present. And now you're gone, and you left me, me wounded, and I'm coming out, calling after you. <clears throat> and then so he speaks about it more on this kind of dynamic of spiritual experience level from uh, six onwards, paragraph six onwards. And that corresponds to more of the level that St. Bernard speaks about throughout his commentary on Song of Songs and the visits, the comings and goings of the bridegroom. Yeah, so much needed clarity from John the Cross on that, those three levels of God's presence, spiritual canticle 11, and then also this, our yearning for the coming of the Lord is ultimately for that final manifestation, the vision where God will no longer be hidden, but will be made manifest completely. Um, but then on a secondary level, we do yearn for glimpses of God, touches of God, kisses of God, uh, manifestations of God in this life through faith, through hope and charity. And so we, we get that here in Spiritual Canticle 1, paragraph 6 onward. He does talk about slaking our thirst in this life with the drop of, of the Lord that can be received in this life. And just another, just a structural note in Spiritual Canticle Stanza 1. Again, I, didn't, I saw this maybe a few years ago for the first time. Um... Towards maybe halfway through the spiritual canticle, you see he starts going through the theological virtues, mm-hmm. faith, hope, and charity. He doesn't say that's what he's doing, but if you look at what, so, um, you know, the early stanzas deal a lot with faith, what it means to approach the Lord through faith, and that goes up through like paragraph 12. And then paragraph 14, he shifts to hope. And then paragraph 16 through 20, it's love. So again, you're just reading kind of through, uh, but to appreciate the inner structure that's behind his thinking as it unfolds is kind of nice. And so you see these three three theological virtues, which are so key to John the Cross's thought. Right, Ascent of Mount Carmel, it's structured according to that. Uh, book one of um, Ascent of Mount Carmel is about kind of the life of the senses, you know, emotional ar- aridity and so forth. Book two is all about faith of Ascent of Mount Carmel. And then book three is about uh, hope and charity. Uh, chapters one through 15 on hope. Chapters 16 onwards through charity. Or it's some, you know, 15, 16, somewhere around there he starts charity. Uh, but book three, it's all about uh, hope and charity of the Cinema Carmel. So the theological virtues are central to John, just like they are in the spiritual life. Mm-hmm. And the gifts of the Holy Spirit are kind of the atmosphere. They kind of elevate the theological virtues and almost put them in their heavenly atmosphere, in their proper atmosphere, where there's a tasting. You know, the gift of wisdom, the gift of the Holy Spirit of wisdom gives us a tasting and builds on charity, that calm naturality of charity. Uh, that at homeness, that charity brings us with the Lord to a tasting of the Lord. And the gift of understanding, a deeper penetration into the truth, you know, beyond concepts, beyond words. So it's kind of like a foretaste of the beatific vision of, of our heavenly homeland. Um, but yeah, the theological virtues are central. We see that already in uh, stanza one, a spiritual canticle, that structure of it. Okay. And again, like I pointed out, like we spoke about last time, visits. You know, paragraph 15, 16, 17, 18... Uh, all about the 
visits of the Lord. And so forth. So the earlier part of Spiritual Canticle 1, John gives us a lot of help in how to, to abide in faith in those times of aridity, in those times of darkness, in those times of desolation. And that the Lord is drawing you beyond your, your puny concepts of the, about the Lord. He's drawing you beyond that, so he's teaching us how to, to deal with those difficult times, those dark times. And, and then he shifts here, then, um, 15 onwards, to talk about these visits of the Lord, where he does come. He usually visits devout souls in order to gladden, enlighten them, and then leaves in order to try, humble, and teach them. There are many kinds of visits God grants to the soul in which he wounds and raises up in love. He usually, right, usually, this is just Christianity. This isn't esoteric um, monasticism. It's Christianity. He usually bestows some secret touches of love that pierce and wound it like fiery arrows, leaving it wholly cauterized by the fire of love. And these wounds mentioned here are properly called wounds of love. And so these touches of the Lord create wounds of love. And there are three levels here, not to be confused with other three levels. Um, it's the creation, the touch of God through creation, knowing God through creation, the longing, the wound of love that creation gives us, the beautiful sunset. It can leave you with a sense of melancholy, the sense of longing for the Lord. That's a wound of love, the first level. And then we have uh, the articles of faith, the scriptures, the second level, the wound of love. You're reading the scriptures and uh, who God is, his love for you pierces your heart and wounds you uh, in love. And then the third level are more of these mystical touches uh, that wound you with a sense of the I don't know what beyond my stammering. No seke, beyond my stammering. We'll open this up more and we'll see where that uh, unose k can come in the midst of reading the scriptures. We'll see some passages where like the two are there together. Um, so yeah, some good clarity from St. John of the Cross. That helps us when we read St. Bernard, and when we read others, to, to think about what's going on here on the theological level in a way that's, that's clear. Okay. So are we good? We're good there? Okay. Um, yeah, there's so much. Okay. Um, so I just want to point out some continuity here. And this is, we're, we're going to shift, so we kind of have set the Trinitarian context. So the theme of this class is uh, Jesus Christ at the center and the Trinity encompassing all. So we, we've seen how it's Trinitarian. Um, Stanza 39 kind of touches on the Trinitarian aspect too, but we don't have time to, to go there. Um, and um, But now we're going to shift more to Jesus Christ. So he, he's, at, he's at the center. So this is... Let's think about the, what I've been, what I've called like the canonical interpretation of Song of Songs. You know that the mystics tend to go in this direction when they look at this first verse. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. And we, and I, I think when we think about it, we're like, yeah, you know, I couldn't come up with a better answer than that. What this is talking about, okay? So they're turning to the Song of Songs. It's this, this great uh, love book about uh, God's love for us, our love for God, and it's going to open up uh, the reality of that before our eyes. So we come to this first verse, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. So what is that going to say about our relationship with the Lord? What does that get at? It gets at a directness, an immediacy, right? The, the kiss of the mouth of the Lord. It gets us at this immediacy, this, this greater directness we can have with the Lord. So Origen and St. Bernard are going to make the same move here. Origen does this in his very first sermon on the Song of Songs, and uh, St. Bernard does it in, in Sermon 2. 
And in fact, Sermon 1 for St. Bernard is on the title of the book, on the Song of Songs. So in fact, it, it's kind of the first thing, you know, so when St. Bernard deals, turns to the first verse of the Song of Songs, um, he makes the same first move that St. Bernard, that, that origin does, that origin does. And it's a good move. It's one of those moves like, it's like, yeah, th- this makes perfect sense. So what does this mean? Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. They're going to talk about it in two ways. So what do you think is... um, So one way is going to be Christological. And the second way is going to be mystical. And the second way derives from the first. It derives from Christ and the immediacy of Christ. So let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. How, How do you think he's going to... How do you think Origen and Bernard are going to... To, yeah, what kind of directness do we have in Jesus Christ? How, how do you think he's going to open that up? Jesus is, at least from what we heard and know, Jesus is the person who comes to us. Yeah. And so the soul goes to Christ asking this question. Oh, yeah. Bestowing the kiss of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Yeah, so this that's, that's sort of the link between, um, yeah, Christ himself and this infused contemplation, it's, yeah, infused contemplation is Christ, the person coming to us in a fuller way, coming to us, enlightening us, inflaming our charity. Um, but, okay, another way to, I know this turns into a little bit, you know, try to guess what I'm thinking. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> there you go. Could it also be because Christ is the mediator between God and man, and as Jesus says no one knows the Father except the Son and to whom I reveal. Exactly, yeah. So Jesus is then going to bring our request for the kiss to the Father who will bestow it upon us. And he's going to bring that kiss him. himself to us. Yeah, so one, so on one level, so both both Origen and Bernard, is going to be uh, salvation history. Mm-hmm. Christ and salvation history. And how there's a new directness that comes to us in the incarnation of Christ. Mm-hmm. So salvation history, Christ and salvation history is one level. And then the, the second level, and from that, and the second level is based on this first, from that is, is going to flow Christ coming to the individual soul in a directness, in a mystical directness, immediacy. I say immediacy, but there's always mediation, um, but more immediate, um, a directness. So and that makes sense with, with the verse, right? Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. You're pining for the soul in the Song of Songs, verse 1. He's pining for this <laughs> intimacy with the Lord, this directness and in intimacy. And so it's going to be a Christological level and salvation history. And then um, on the personal level, uh, the word and the soul. The word becoming flesh and salvation history and the word's visit to the soul. And uh, these encounters with the Lord beyond all words, beyond all concepts. Though the concepts help get us there. So another way to think about this is we have the four senses of scripture. How would you line these up with the four senses of scripture? And by the way, this is, this is a common move for Bernard to look at the verse in terms of Christ in light of salvation history. And then look at the verse in terms of Christ and the soul. Christ and, and the bride, his, his church, the bridegroom and the bride and his church. And so Christ in salvation history, Christ in my own salvation history. Mm-hmm. Right, we have our own salvation histories, our own stories that are played out uh, and God interacting with us that are modeled after his interactions with humanity in uh, his salvation history uh, publicly, you know, capital S, the divine scriptures, the revelation. Mm-hmm. You know, we have our time in the desert like Israel did for 40 years in the desert. Mm-hmm. Dom Johan, one of the Carthusian monks, he always said it's a big anniversary when a monk has been in the monastery for 40 years. <laughs> it's a big anniversary. Because, uh, yeah, it's the 40 years of Israel in, uh, in the desert. And St. Bernard, he does, he does talk about that. You know, the, the 40 years of Israel in the desert. We have our own 40 years. And sometimes, you know, it's more like three or four years. It's more like this period, that period. These things come back. But it's based on the pattern of salvation, pattern of of redemption. It's repeated in our lives. 
what God did publicly for everyone gets personalized. <clears throat> and so St. Bernard often makes this move. How this passage in Song of Songs applies to, to Christ, the Word made flesh, and salvation history, capital S, capital H, uh, public revelation, and then how it applies the Word coming to the soul. And they're, they're modeled after one another. The second follows from the first. We mentioned last week uh, the four senses of Scripture. You have the literal sense and then the three spiritual senses built on top of the literal sense. So the three spiritual senses, how would, uh, which, so just say what I said in, in light of the three spiritual senses. Take out two of the three, the th- two of the three spiritual senses maps onto what I just described. First, can someone re- uh, rattle off the three spiritual senses, the literal sense, then you have the what? Allegorical. Allegorical. Moral. Moral. Eschatological. Eschatological, yep, the anagogical. Anagogical. Yep, so again, this is just basic catechism class. Uh, this is in the catechism. <laughs> no, it's in the catechism of the Catholic Church. I don't know what you're reading. <laughs> I don't know what you were raised on, but <laughs> <laughs> second graders are learning this. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking a little, a little bit, a little bit. <laughs> no, this is the way, yeah, this is the way, what it should be. Yeah, so you have the allegorical, you have the tropological or the moral sense, and then you have the anagogical sense. So what I just described um, with this passage, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, how would you um, break that down? I have to guess. Yeah. So, the allegorical, would that be Christ actually coming in the incarnation? Perfect. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, and then Christ coming to the soul would be the, the tropological, like the moral. Mm-hmm. How this applies to my own spiritual life. Mm-hmm. Um, the moral. And then there is a sense of the anagogical. I mean, it is, because let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. That comes to fulfillment on that last day. And probably, you know, at some point, St. Bernard will, will say that as well. But that's part of it. The kiss of the mouth. I mean, okay, there are, there are kisses in this life. But that ultimate kiss it comes in the beatific vision. So that's the anagogical sense here. Yeah, so this is a good example. This is a beautiful example of... Um, thinking through the spiritual senses of scripture and, and how it becomes almost a canonical way of reading. Uh, you know, a church-sanctioned way because these saints are reading it in this way. And so the allegorical, it's this directness of Christ's coming. And so St. Bernard in Sermon 2, you know, and Origen in Sermon 1 say, you know, Old Testament, the prophets yearning for Christ. And St. Bernard, he begins his sermon that's during Advent. So he says, monks, you know, we're, we're in Advent time now. And we're, we're reliving the anticipation of, of the prophets. And they're crying out for the coming of the Lord. And let's, you know, re-enter into that yearning, that pining for the Lord. You know, don't speak to me anymore through the mouths of the prophets. You know, speak to me directly. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. And that's just what we read in Hebrews 1. Uh, in many and diverse ways, God spoke to people of old through the prophets. In this last age, he has spoken to us through his Son, whom he has named heir of all things. That's that directness, that, that kiss to kiss. And so St. Bernard, you know, he's, he'll speak about the incarnation in those terms. That's the kiss of humanity and divinity in the, incarnate, in the hypostatic union of Jesus Christ. And so there's a directness there that we haven't experienced in humanity before Christ. And so St. Bernard opens it up this way. So this is the beginning of Sermon 2, second paragraph. So, you know, he's, he's asked us to go back into the Old Testament times. The conscientious man, either the man who was aware back in those days, might repeat to himself, of what use to me are the wordy effusions of the prophets, Rather, let him who is the most handsome of the sons of men, let him kiss me with the kiss of his mouth. No longer am I satisfied to listen to Moses, for he is a slow speaker and not able to speak well. 
Isaiah is a man of unclean lips. Jeremiah does not know how to speak. He is a child. Not one of the prophets makes an impact on me anymore with his words. Who is it? So this is St. Bernard, uh, Sermon 2, uh, Paragraph 2. You know, he's a little exaggerated. I mean, the, the prophets are still great to read. <laughs> but he's just saying, in, compas- in comparison to what humanity is longing for, what, in comparison with what these prophets are longing for, uh, yeah, it's like, yeah, he's a stutterer, Moses is. We want this direct speech from God himself. We want the son. Jeremiah says, does not know how to speak well. He's a child. Not one of the prophets makes an impact on me with his words. But he... The one whom they proclaim, let him speak to me, let him kiss me with the kiss of his mouth. I have no desire that he should approach me in their person or address me with their words, for they are a watery darkness, a dense cloud. Rather, in his own person, let him kiss me with the kiss of his mouth. So that's God speaking to us directly in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. This is what the prophets longed for. This is what, you know, we, we continue to enter into that longing, to appreciate the gift that we do have in the Lord Jesus, and that God speaks to us directly as, as through the Son. <clears throat> so, you know, I, I won't go, through, but yeah, so Origen, he, he starts that same place in uh, Sermon 1. Um, the kiss of the mouth is the coming of Christ, um, you know, to humanity. He speaks to us in his own person, not, not through the prophets. Uh, so that, that's the first level. And then, uh, then from that comes the second level. So God does speak to us directly through the word of God, through Jesus' words. But sometimes Jesus' words expand for us. You know, think of the road to Emmaus. The disciples are walking with the Lord. He opens up the scriptures to them. He illumines their minds to understand the scriptures. Were not our hearts burning within us when he opened up the scriptures to us? So we have these precious words of scripture, the precious words of Jesus, uh, that are so precious in themselves, that are so direct in themselves, which are so much a kiss of the kiss of the mouth. Uh, but sometimes the Lord opens up that before our eyes, opens up the mystery. We're, we're kind of blown away by how great God is. We're, we're struck, awestruck wonder. And our hearts are held captive, we're drawn captive. Our hearts are burning within us as we ponder the scriptures. He enlightens our minds, he opens our minds to understand. And he enkindles our hearts, we're not our hearts burning within us. So you see that same dynamic of intellect being enlightened, will being enkindled. You already see that on the road to Emmaus, Luke chapter 22, or 24, I forget, the last chapter of Luke. Um, So we see that already there. So then um, Origen then turns that direction as well. And St. Bernard makes that next move as well. So here's St. Bernard describing it. So the word... We have the word of God, public revelation, the scriptures, the words of Jesus, direct revelation, but sometimes uh, that comes with with light, that comes with power, uh, that comes with a fullness that we don't always have. And this is a visit of the word to the soul, on kind of the third level, the mystical level, affectively. Um, Okay. And they, they spring from Christ, they spring from the word. You know, it's the word of God that's the center here, but these words uh, expand at times. But since she does not find in these the full and perfect satisfaction of her desire and love, let her pray that her pure and virginal mind may be enlightened by the illumination and the visitation of the word of God himself. For when her mind is filled with divine perception and understanding, without the agency of human or angelic ministration. Then she may believe she has received the kisses of the word of God himself. So this visitation of the word of God, illuminations of the mind, filled with divine perceptions by the word himself. Lights and insights is what he'll call it a little bit later from the Lord. Later he also calls it a word of love. So we see the emphasis of love here. And let us understand that by the mouth of the bridegroom is meant the power by which he enlightens the mind 
as by some word of love addressed to her, if she so deserved to experience the presence of, uh, or of power so great. So we see this emphasis on love as well. You know, so he's not, he doesn't spell it out as you know, clearly as like St. Thomas, intellect alive and will and kindled with love, uh, but we see him talking about the same reality because he's experiencing the same reality that St. Thomas experienced. Uh, that St. Bernard experience, that St. John of the Cross. So they're all speaking about the same reality. So there, there can be textual dependence here. You know, St. Bernard is following uh, St. Ort, not St., but Origen sometimes. He's following Origen sometimes. Uh, there's textual dependence. But on the other hand, they're just dealing with the same reality of Christian life. The mind being uh, enlightened, the heart being inflamed in these visits of the Lord. So that's why there's such unanimity on this in like St. Thomas, St. John of the Cross, um, because of this, this Christian life and following the scriptures and following the saints who have gone before us. So just a little bit more how uh, Origen describes these things. As the third point in our exposition, so this is kind of the third level we've been speaking about, this third mode of uh, God's presence in John of the Cross's rendering in Spiritual Canto 11. Uh, as the third point in our exposition, let us bring in the soul whose only desire is to be united to the word of God and to be in fellowship with him and to enter into the mysteries of his wisdom and knowledge as into the chambers of his heavenly bridegroom, her heavenly bridegroom. Right? So it's, it's this intimacy with the Lord being brought into the mysteries of his wisdom and knowledge. And for Origen, Bernard, John of the Cross, it's very much word-centered. And very much for St. Paul, too, right? It's, it's St. Paul's language, the wisdom and knowledge of God, of Christ, that we have in Christ, Colossians 2 or 1. Mm-hmm. And so to see this, yeah, it's not just a head trip, it's not just uh, studying, because people kind of poo-poo knowledge now, you know, <laughs> in favor of love. Yeah. And certainly love, love is the greatest. Um, but... <laughs> Opening up the riches of Christ, the fullness of wisdom and knowledge, it involves this knowing loving, this loving knowledge. It involves entering into the mystery itself. Right? Intellect is how we take reality into ourselves. Will is as how we go out to reality. And so these are realities. So the scriptures, you know, to, to have the, the full wisdom and truth that we have in Christ, those riches. The scriptures don't just tell us about those realities. The, the scriptures mediate us, mediate to us those realities. Our act of faith, our faith, hope, and charity doesn't terminate in the scriptures, this idea of the fullness of wisdom in Christ and treasures in Christ. Uh, our faith like penetrates to the reality of those riches and treasures of Christ um, and the wisdom of Christ. And so that's why the bridegroom is the word for origin, for Bernard, for um, St. John of the Cross as well. He always speaks about the, the bridegroom, the wisdom of God, John of the Cross speaks a lot about as well. And that's Jesus Christ. That's the word. And that's and we're brought into the mystery of that intimacy. So let us bring in the soul, origin says, whose only desire is to be united to the word of God, and to be in fellowship with him, and to enter into the mysteries of his wisdom and knowledge, as into the chambers of her heavenly bridegroom. So St. John of the Cross, as you saw in Spiritual Canticle 37, he starts in 36 as well, then shifts to 37. Uh, the mysteries of Christ's life are these chambers, are these treasure houses of the wisdom and knowledge of God are these mysteries that we're brought into contact with, that we enter into, that we're engulfed in. Not enough time. Not enough time. Um, Let her pray that our pure and virginal mind may be enlightened by the illumination and visitation of the word of God himself. For when her mind is filled with divine perception and understanding without the agency of human or angelic ministration, then she may believe she has received the kisses of the word of God himself, that directness, mystical directness. Moreover, the plural kisses is used in order that we may understand that the lighting up of every obscure meaning is a kiss of the word of God bestowed on the perfected soul. 
So Origen, you know, you're studying the scriptures, you're seeking the Lord in the scriptures, and sometimes things open up. Problems begin to unravel. Clarity is introduced into your mind. That's a visit. That's a kiss of the word of God. I opened my mouth and drew breath. <laughs> the plural kisses is used so we can think about the Holy Spirit there as well. Uh, the plural kisses is used in order that we may understand that the lighting up of every obscure meaning is a kiss of the word of God bestowed on the perfected soul. And it was perhaps with reference to this that the prophetic and perfected soul declared, I opened my mouth and drew breath. And let us understand by the mouth of the bridegroom is meant the power by which he enlightens the mind as by some word of love addressed to her. Again, this idea in Bernard that scriptures, when you receive them as addressed to you with confidence, with conviction, that's a visit of the word. The power by which he enlightens the mind as by some word of love, Origen says, addressed to her, right? Her personally. Um, if so, she deserves to experience the presence of power and power so, so great. Let us make her prayer our own and beg from God the visitation of his words, saying, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. For the Father knows each single soul's capacity and understands the right time for a soul to receive the kisses of the word in lights and insights of this sort. So that, that's origin, and it's all right there. And then St. Bernard then uh, just builds on that. And so then he makes this, so St. Bernard makes the same transition. Uh, this applies to, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. It applies to the coming of the word made flesh. Uh, publicly, salvation history, him speaking not no longer through the prophets, but directly as his son. And now from here, we then move on to this, this third level again, him visiting us. So then St. Bernard says, let him kiss me with the kiss of his mouth. Let him whose presence is full of love, from whom exquisite doctrines flow in streams, exquisite, exquisite doctrines flow in streams, let him become a spring inside of me, welling up to eternal life. Right? John 7, John 4. Shall I not receive a richer infusion of grace from him whom the Father has anointed with the oil of gladness above his rivals? Provide that he will bestow on me the kiss of his mouth. For his living, active word is to me a kiss. Not indeed an, an adhering of the lips that can sometimes belie a union of hearts, but an unreserved infusion of joys, a revealing of mysteries, right? a manifestation of mysteries, a marvelous and indistinguishable mingling of the divine light with the enlightened mind, which joined in truth to God is one spirit with him. So this kiss of the kiss of the mouth is, is on this level as well. The Lord coming and his word and, and a, a fullness, a fullness of love from whom exquisite doctrines flow and streams flow into my heart, becoming a spring inside of me, welling up to eternal life. Uh, this knowledge that, that pours forth life, not just a dry knowledge, but a knowledge that's given me life inside, a spring inside of me, welling up to eternal life. Shall I not receive a richer infusion of grace from the Lord, whom the Father has anointed with the oil of gladness above all his rivals, provided that he will bestow on me the kiss of his mouth? His living, active word is to me a kiss. An unreserved infusion of joys, a revealing of mysteries, a marvelous and indistinguishable mingling of the divine light with the enlightened soul, which joined in truth to God is one spirit with him. Okay. Let's, as just the last five minutes here, see how this comes out in John of the Cross in a certain combination. So, St. Bernard, um, Sermon 61 to 62, are about the clefts in the rock. You know, so Song of Songs is something like let. You know, let us hide in the clefts of the rock. Let me hide in the clefts of the rock. And so St. Bernard opens that up and says, uh, he says a lot of things, but one of the things he says is, 
The clefts in the rock are the wounds of Christ. And we abide in the clefts of the rock, that place of security. St. Bernard talks about, you know, hiding in that cleft of the rock with your beloved, with the Lord, and that intimacy, that secret dwelling. You know, we heard that in Spiritual Canticle 1. You do not, you know, you have to conceal yourself with that hidden treasure. Become hidden with, with him, the depths of your soul, the cleft of the rock. And it's not just a neutral space that's cleft in the rock. You know, it's, it's the wounds of Jesus. The mysteries of Christ are there. The place of security of his wounds. God's love being poured forth through his heart. Sermon 61 has beautiful expressions of that. God's love is manifest through his wounded heart, through his wounds. And we seek refuge in them through meditation on the passion, St. Bernard says. So that place of intimacy with the Lord, that hiding in the cleft of the rock, or is hiding in the wounds of Christ. So then St. John of the Cross sees that, and it's like, yeah, that's good, St. Bernard. That's good. But let's just open it up just a little bit more. Yeah, it's about the passion of Christ. These clefts in the rock are about the passion of Christ, the wounds of Christ. But isn't it also about all the mysteries of Christ's life? So all the mysteries of Christ's life are these clefts in the rock. These places that we enter into, that we find our refuge, our safety, where grace is poured uh, into us, where we're surrounded by grace in these mysteries. And so St. John of the Cross in Spiritual 36, and also, but more completely, Spiritual Canticle 37. 37 is a key Christological chapter for John of the Cross. And uh, these mysteries, these high caverns in the rock, these clefts in the rock are the mysteries of Christ. So I'll just end with, with some passages about these. And we see here that this uno se que that John the Cross speaks about, the I don't know what beyond my stammering that we come into contact with in prayer, especially as God manifests himself in these ways in infused contemplation. Um, that these, that the depth here is entering more deeply into the mysteries of Christ. So it's not an idea that, okay, you enter into the depths of contemplation, you leave Christ behind. You're on to higher things. No. It's not that at all. The very depths that you're being drawn to are entering more deeply into the caverns of Christ's mysteries. Where you bottom out. Where you, your feet can't reach the bottom. So that however deep individuals may go, they may never reach the end or bottom. But rather, in every recess, find new veins, new riches everywhere. St. John of the Cross says. So again, spent a lot of time on Spiritual Canticle 37. Number 1 and 37. Are so key. Spent a lot of time there. But let me just read, read some of this. So the depths of contemplation for the Christian, uh, for John of the Cross, for St. Bernard, is about entering into the mysteries of Christ. And you never bottom out. So this is number 2 of stanza 37. So here's the stanza itself, and we'll hear the word concealed, just like Spiritual Canticle 1. And then we will go on to the high caverns in the rock, and the rock is Christ, of course, which are so well concealed, there we shall enter and taste the fresh juice of the pomegranates. So just skipping down a little bit, halfway through number two, these mysteries, the mysteries of the incarnation, are exalted in wisdom, and the soul enters the knowledge of them, engulfing and immersing herself in them. <laughs> so these mysteries of Christ are not just something that you ponder over here, outside of yourself. You begin there. Uh, but you, are, you enter into them. You're immersed in these mysteries. You're engulfed by these mysteries. These mysteries are exalted in wisdom, and the soul enters the knowledge of them, engulfing and immersing herself in them. They're caverns we enter into, clefts in the rock. And both the bride and the bridegroom will taste the savoriness and the delight caused by the knowledge of these mysteries, together with the powers and attributes of God uncovered in them, such as justice, mercy, wisdom, power, charity, and so on. And then number three, the rock we mention here, as St. Paul says, is Christ. The high caverns of this rock are the sublime, exalted, and deep mysteries of God's wisdom in Christ in the hypostatic union of the human nature with the divine word, and in the corresponding union of human beings with God. 
could say more here, but uh, I'll keep going. Um, um, <laughs> okay, now I do, I've got this point. I just wrote really. So it's not just the mystery of the incarnation and the union of uh, divinity and humanity in Christ are being brought into that unity as part of this mystery of Christ. Gregor Nazianzus puts it this way. He's reflecting on the incarnation. He says, what is this mystery which is all around me? <laughs> now, what is this mystery that was 2,000 years ago? Uh, but what is this mystery that's all around me? We're brought up into this mystery. So John of the Cross says, the high caverns of this rock are the sublime, exalted, and deep mysteries of God's wisdom in Christ. In the hypostatic union of the human nature with the divine word and in the corresponding union of human beings with God. Uh, there's a lot there. And the mystery of the harmony between God's justice and mercy, and so forth. These mysteries are so profound that she very appropriately calls them high caverns. High because of the height of the sublime mysteries, and caverns because of the depth of God's wisdom in them. As caverns are deep and have many recesses, so each of the mysteries of Christ is singularly deep in wisdom and contains many recesses of the secret judgments, uh, and so forth. There is much to fathom in Christ, for he is like an abundant mind with many recesses of treasures. So that however deep individuals may go, they never reach the end or the bottom. We never bottom out. But rather, in every recess, find new veins, new riches everywhere. On this account, St. Paul said of Christ, Colossians 2.3, In Christ dwells hidden all treasures and wisdom. The soul cannot enter these caverns or reach these treasures if, as we said, she does not first pass over to the divine wisdom through the straits of exterior and interior suffering. Right? We, for, 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 for perfection, we need suffering. God's trials, you know, God's um, visits in this way. Number two, for one cannot reach in this life what is attainable of these mysteries of Christ without having suffered much, without having received numerous intellectual and sensible favors from God. Number two, and without having undergone much spiritual activity. For all these favors are inferior to the wisdom of the mysteries of Christ, and that they serve as preparations for coming to this wisdom. And just one, one more passage, and then we'll, we'll close things here. Uh, okay, maybe two more passages. Okay. Because <laughs> I want to end, we'll end on the Trinitarian. Okay. Uh, the soul is, but the short, short passage. The soul then earnestly longs to enter these caverns of Christ in order to be absorbed, transformed, and wholly inebriated in the love of the wisdom of these mysteries and hide herself in the bosom of the beloved. <laughs> the soul earnestly longs to enter these caverns of Christ in order to be absorbed in them, transformed by them, and wholly inebriated in the love of the wisdom of these mysteries. Right? That holy inebriation, the new wine of Cana, the sober intoxication, and hide herself in the bosom of the beloved. And now listen to this Trinitarian uh, key here. The Father predisposed the just with the blessings of his sweetness and his Son, Jesus Christ. The soul is most sublimely and intimately transformed in the love of God. And with unspeakable delight... She thanks and loves the Father again through his Son, Jesus Christ. She does this united with Christ, together with Christ. And they savor this, this praise of, of the Father together beyond, beyond all words. Okay, so we, we close in prayer. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we ask you to sweep us up in your love in the mysteries of Christ, in these caverns, where we're absorbed in your love, where we enter more deeply into these mysteries, where we're inebriated by these mysteries, drawing us out of ourselves more and more to you. And there, in the caverns of these rocks, engulfed in the mysteries of Christ, may we sing this canticle of praise to you, Father, with your Son, Jesus Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we pray together as Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.